Um, thank you very much again. My name is Doreen Lorenzo. Um, I am the president of Frog. Um, we're a global innovation company. And I really, really am very glad to be here um, at the developers conference. So I'll tell you a little bit about Frog. Um, we work with the leading companies, helping them to design, engineer, and bring to market meaningful products and services. We have an interdisciplinary team of over 1,000 designers, strategists, and software engineers. And we deliver connected experiences um, that span multiple technologies, platforms, and media. And we work across uh, a whole bunch of industries. Now, when I look out at the steady growth of the Twilio developer con uh, community, it's really interesting to look out here and see how cloud computing is fast changing the way that we all do business. Um, it'll soon have far-reaching effects on our lives. So two years ago, our clients would talk about the cloud as a discrete other. Uh, you know, it's an add-on to their existing capital assets. Uh, much like what we saw when the web was popular, they wanted a website strategy, or mobile apps, they wanted a mobile app strategy. Today, they, you know, they would talk about cloud strategy. But I think we've all learned that's much bigger. Um, and we're still at the very beginning of cloud development, so it's a great time to talk about the cloud in context. It's also a great time to talk about how the cloud is becoming a tangible force in our lives, and for me, What's really important is to talk about how we can design better experiences for the cloud, because we have the opportunity to do that at the very beginning now. So the cloud experience is now synonymous with the computing experience. It's not just a big hard drive in the sky, and it's well beyond the purview of the IT departments. You know, they don't own that anymore. In one way or another, um, whatever industry you're in, whether it's healthcare, automotive, retail, you name it, it's all about the cloud. And the cloud experience is core to their business. And you know, right now, it's becoming the main way that we access information in our world. So when you look at the far-reaching impact the cloud has had from the societal to the human scale, it's really shaping the way we interact with each other. Um, and we know from the Arab Spring to our own elections, it's really changing our cultures and governments. Um, how many of you watched the debate last night? Right? I thought um, the uh, binders of women meme that went crazy and viral, I mean, that just took seconds, right, to kind of reach everywhere. So for us, data is, is generated and mined at an unprecedented pace right now. Now, it's only been a couple of years since we transitioned from thinking about the cloud to encompassing a larger vision of cloud computing or the cloud experience. So how did we get there? I like to say we can think about this in three specific ways. Now, these are just inflections. Um, now, when I look out here, though it's dark, I know that there's very few people who can remember when computers filled a room. It's difficult to explain if you haven't seen this, and please don't pay attention to the lovely um, fashion there, but it's difficult to explain how revolutionary a personal computer was when it came into the scene. And so the personal computer was really the first wave. Now, in this wave, we became the operators, and this was huge. It was amazing to have a machine that fit on our desk. It opened us up to a new world in people. But still, the experience was limited to raw data resources, floppy disk, and rigid keyboard entry. Uh, the user interface expanded from command line interaction, but we were still very much pushing those buttons. And our output was tied to local resources. We had these large, bulky monitors and big speakers. And trust me, there was no notion of cloud in those days. Now, although the PC bought the masses access to information and computing power, it clearly was stuck in one place. We could not look at this and say that was portable. And it lacked any context to our surrounding world. Uh, the second wave, which is where, where we are today, offered a huge improvement. 
connection became much more evident. Connectivity is available to us almost all the time, wherever we are, and it's thanks to these smaller devices and, and of course, cloud services. The experience is also out front. Platforms are more accessible, and more people are participating both at a consumer and developer's level. And I think we could all agree that it actually looks and feels better. But the device is still very limited in how it sees the outside world, and we're still pushing buttons. Yes, it's a touchscreen, but we're still pushing buttons. And the cloud has emerged, in this case, as an important player in the second wave, but we're still very device-centric. Now, the biggest shift in the second wave is that the computing is tied to a single person. We're so reliant on our devices that we've become babysitters to them. I'm sure you all feel that way. I know they've asked me not to have my phone with me, and I had that momentary, really, I can't take my phone with me out onto the stage? We have vastly expanded data sources. They're still largely raw, uh, shared storage, and high screen touch entry. And our current UX mental model is a unitary experience, us and our device. Now, when we're interacting with the world via our device, we see nothing else. We are so absorbed. So this device, if you think about it, has become our window to the world. We often get so engrossed in our devices, we forget the first human interface is the world around us as evidenced by this woman you know, walking into the fountain. I have no idea if this is staged or not. I just thought, you know, when I look at this, it's a great representation. I can tell you I have crashed into more light posts and people uh, walking through, looking and texting and looking at my device. Um, at one point, I, was, I asked our designers, do you think we should make a crash helmet? Do you think there's a market there for a crash helmet? Because so many people are, are getting hurt with it. They told me no. Um, but as we walk and crash with our devices, we do adapt. We start to form ideas about how interacting with the world, traveling through this device window. So in the third wave, we look to evolve beyond our devices, and the cloud becomes the central player. So get the computers out of computing, essentially. Now in this third wave, it has millions of inputs, thousands of outputs, it's always with you, yet you don't carry it. It can be shared, or it can be private, and it will put together a comprehensive picture of any situation anywhere. Most importantly, it can be enjoyed without the burden of its machinery. So what I'm really saying, the cloud is the new computer. Now, the cloud's value proposition is information about the world when it's most valuable to us. So for example, you get a hankering for some Chinese food, and you start walking towards a restaurant. Well, your whole experience will change. The cloud becomes a more central actor to our world because it can contextualize information and take us through the device window. It's about the world in the world. So as we've worked with our clients on cloud computing issues, um, we've discovered a couple of trends, or four trends I want to talk to you about. So it's pervasive and surrounding, not only with a computer, but within a computer. Networks, sensors, interface. We're seeing the early indications of a third wave where devices give way to the world around us. This is a story of computing experience moving from individual boxes to the world, the collective ecosystem of devices, network, data sets, and people. So the cloud is the connector. Sensors are all around us capturing data every second. But where does the data go? And how can it be used to give a picture of our surroundings or our conditions? Again, if we start to imagine lever leveraging that sensor-captured data used within a timely context of when and where it's needed, we start to see the possibilities. Now, there was a study uh, done in Singapore by MIT, and it's a mashup of data from inputs and sensors in space to create 
a layered city playback. This is the density of cabs to the density of rainfall, which equals here a city interface. Kind of interesting to what you can do with this. And if you take that theme, when you look at working at a working city, you begin to realize that within the power of sensor technology, working with the cloud, we can really begin to use our world as a platform. So everyone, everything, and everywhere becomes part of a very shared system. Or we are the computer. This began in the most subtle way. We take so many pictures. I'm sure people are out there snapping today. Uh, we began to create this living digitalization of the world around us, but it's not just quite reliable as yet. Let's talk about seamfulness. Uh, think about this as knowingly using the seams within a design. Computers can be everywhere. They're part of what we do. They can provide much more than utility. So let's take a look at a fun way that this can be done. So I'm not sure if that's a breakout session later this afternoon, but I'm assuming that you'll all be able to do that by the time you leave the conference. Um, let's talk about choreographed interactions. You know, this is where voice and motion replacing, replaces button pushing. Um, I'm going to show you something by a, a person named Jared Ficklin. He's a frog fellow, and he's demonstrating a frog e-room concept uh, using gesture and voice instead of buttons. Turn off light one. Turn on light two. Turn on light one. Turn off all the lights. Turn on that one. Turn on that one. Turn off the light. Turn off the lights. Computer, it's dark in here. Yes, the room is quite dark. Would you like me to turn on light one, light two, or all of the lights available? No, thank you, but do turn off light one. So a product of big data, this notion of information about an event or a thing becoming more interesting than the event or the thing. So the quantified life. So here's Jenny and Andrew. Will they get to a point where people's online stats are equally, or God forbid, more meaningful than actually a face-to-face -face interaction? 
When we're able to contextualize information in line with our lives, the storyline can become more dense. Uh, we can begin to visualize data, tell stories using data points, and even have objects become relatable as storytellers in a sense. So everything can tell a story. So then what we get is a truly ubiquitous computing environment, providing not just the utility we expect, but new layers of meaning in our lives. Not only are daily interactions with data fueling the continued expansion of this ubiquitous computing environment, our behavior is evolving because of it. This paradigm creates new opportunities as well as challenges for the technology companies designing cloud-enabled products. Now, what are some of the important tenets of, for designing products for the cloud? Obviously, something very close to my heart. As technology companies embrace cloud-based products and services, their digital offerings need to address the human need for tangibility and permanence. So let's talk about it. Physicality. Let's objectify the physical manifestation in the cloud. We need tangible, real-world objects that symbolize what's stored in the cloud. So we know iconic devices like the iPhone remind us of all the data that lies behind them, yet they're easy to use. We have to offer a continuous feedback loop. It's uploaded in real time. This will reduce the fear and the headache of, an, of something that's called you know, the inaccurate data. Provide instantaneous local access to the data that resides remotely in the cloud. This will lower the barrier or eliminate the feeling of distance from data stored in the cloud. And security. Ensure the security of the user's digital data as a signature element of the experience. But only by elevating and choreographing safety can you re reassure the user that the cloud is a safe place to store valuable information. OK, where are we going from here? What's some predictions? Today, the cloud is really about storage and sync. Tomorrow, it'll be more to enable decision-making for us and present us with more knowledge and less data. You know, the cloud today is a go-between for many unitary devices, meaning devices that are full-featured and capable of serving users on their own, your PC, the smartphone, tablets, etc. But tomorrow, the cloud is, will empower a new class of devices that are dependent on the cloud. The cloud will be the core of the computer rather than the device that it serves. And we'll see many more devices that work in swarms, work as pure input or pure output and devices that are minimized in form and function in order to slip into the background. I think a new power structure will emerge. You know, in the age of discovery, the countries that had the strongest navies um, would control the commerce. So I think those that control the cloud ecosystem will have all the power. And I can guarantee you that the biggest players in tech will be names that we don't know today. Um, I think we've all seen that story play out before. The cloud and the information it provides will go to represent everything. You know, today the cloud has only the most basic data about the larger world. Um, the product info, location data, personal data, it's all exploding. This info re uh, representation of people, places, and things will grow to a point where everything and everybody has its own data story, its own spine. So developing products and services for the cloud is really an exercise in convergent design. And this is something I can say since my time at Frog, we've been talking about uh, all those years. Creating physical objects to embody an experience that is becoming largely virtual. And an increasing number of everyday objects in the physical world now have virtual counterparts and infinite streams of data. You need to fully engage the creative spirit of your organization to develop products for this new world. Invest time in getting to know your users. There's no substitute for thorough and ongoing design research to grasp some of the inherent contradictions that are lying ahead of us. So what are some provocations? So guess what? 
There are real hard limits to what you can know and what you do once you know it. So more data and more compute is useful, but only to a point, and that point depends on the domain that you might be modeling. Not only do you reach diminishing returns pretty quickly, but the cost and efficiency of implementing those changes, plus the fact that things change so quickly, means that you will fail or capitalize on them unless you're fast, you pick the right insights to capitalize, and you run with it. You have to still engineer robustly, because things will always break. Uh, building cloud-centric systems that only work when everything is operational is a bad design business and a bad business practice. And I think what's really important is sometimes the best algorithms are people. Uh, they can still do things that machines can't or may never be able to do, and they're tied into the cloud in very similar ways. It's a reminder that what we call cloud computing is actually nothing like an actual cloud. This is far from being remote or very, very distant. It's very real. It's a translation of ourselves in ones and zeros. So by remembering the human element, and this is one of the best design tenets I can, I can impart with you, by remembering the human element, you can develop superior products and services. I think you're going to accelerate the cloud's development and leverage technology to make our world a better place. And I can almost guarantee that's why you're all sitting here. So I want to thank you very much for the time, and thank you for allowing me to come and speak to you.